Welcome to the first in what will be a regular series of videos from the SCAN IT team, comparing and contrasting the performance and suitability of enterprise-grade tech, starting with NVIDIA data center GPU accelerators. Now, there's a whole range of them available, and the marketing blurb tells us that each one may be perfect for a given use, but what does that truly mean? How much will your application performance really suffer by choosing a cheaper card? Will that extra memory have any bearing on a particular workflow? Are four lower spec GPUs better than using two higher spec ones? Well, subscribe to the Scan IT channel and we'll do our best to answer these questions and more. Now, at the time of making this video, the latest data center GPUs from NVIDIA are based on the Ampere architecture, which on paper delivers huge amounts of performance across the entire range. However, unlike, say, the consumer-grade GeForce RTX 30 series GPUs, with the data center GPUs, the higher the model number doesn't necessarily mean increased performance and capability across the board, as these data center-grade cars are designed very much with specific uses in mind. Now, before we get into individual cars, let's take a moment to understand what we mean by the term data center when referring to GPU accelerators. Firstly, it means that the cards are tried, tested, and certified for high demand, always on environments where constant and consistent performance and reliability are key. It usually refers to an enhanced warranty period, availability of certified drivers for a wide range of applications, and additional features such as ECC memory, standing for error correcting code, which is designed to protect data from corruption so that any errors are eradicated prior to them affecting the workload being processed. For these reasons, data center GPUs are more expensive than their consumer equivalents. The term data center is also used to define the applications and workloads that they're designed for, such as high-end visualization, rendering, virtualized GPU services, high-performance computing, plus deep learning and AI. The range of NVIDIA data center GPUs is passively cooled, aimed solely at use in servers where cooling is carried out by the chassis fans. And the range comprises of the A100, A30, A40, A16, A10 and A2. Now, as we mentioned earlier, ascending numbers don't always correspond to a higher performance model. And to complicate things even further, we're throwing one extra card into the mix. That's the NVIDIA RTX A5000. This is technically a workstation card, but with active cooling. It offers such a sweet spot for a server build though, as we'll demonstrate soon, that we've included it in this guide to data sensor GPUs. To better understand any relative performance and ideal use cases, we need to break the range up into three specific uses. High demand scientific computing workloads, such as HPC and AI. High performance visualization and virtualized GPU applications, such as rendering NVIDIA VWS or Omniverse Enterprise. And lower performance virtualized GPU applications, such as virtual PCs. As you can see from the comparison table, the different models have been designed to excel at specific workloads rather than perform a mediocre job across all of them. Let's look at the first subset, data intensive workflows such as HPC and AI. The A100 card features 80 gigabytes of super fast HBM2 memory combined with a high tensor core count and the fastest NV link speed. This makes this card ideal for the most intensive AI model training, data analytics, and large batch inferencing. Now, it's also worth mentioning at this point that the A100 is also available in an embedded SXM format alongside the PCIe version that features better sustained performance, but at the cost of higher power consumption. Next is the A30, essentially a little brother to the A100. More cost effective, it's about half the price, but with less HBM2 memory, fewer cores, and a slower NV link. For lighter workloads in this space, like small batch AI inferencing, the A10 or A2 will perform well. The A2 offering much lower and variable power consumption. But if your intent is to use the same system for training and inference, then either the A30 or the A100 is the way to go. The next workload area to consider is high-performance visualization applications, such as rendering or delivery of demanding virtual GPU services, such as NVIDIA Virtual Workstation or NVIDIA Omniverse Enterprise. Here, the A40 is the flagship card with over 10,000 CUDA cores, plus high numbers of Tensor and RT cores, combined with 48 gigabytes of memory. In this scenario, the A10 acts as the little brother, 
Although calls are slightly reduced in number, there's only half the memory and no NVLink. The choice between the A40 and the A10 will likely come down to either the complexity of visualization that you're working with or the amount of virtual users and applications that you're looking to support. Lastly, there are low-end, high-volume virtualized GPU services such as NVIDIA Virtual PC, where demand from any individual user will be minimal. The A16 is specifically designed to deliver this type of virtualized workload, as reflected by the card featuring four GPUs with much smaller 16 gigabytes of memory and fewer cores per GPU. Again, the number of users supported by a single A16 will depend on the applications and the workloads being used, although if low power use is a must, then again the A2 card plays nicely in this space too. Finally, spanning a good cross-section of these workloads sits the RTX A5000, but at a lower price point, making it a good choice for less demanding projects. Having looked at each use case the range of data center cards are aimed at, it's also worth pointing out that in the cases of the A100 versus the A30 or the A40 versus the A10, where the cost of the higher end card may be approaching double the lower card, the additional cost is often justified when considering productivity. The A100 and A40, respectively, will achieve much faster time to scientific analysis results or much shorter rendering times for complex projects. So if commercial advantage hinges on these factors, the higher GPU costs may easily be worth the extra outlay. Having said that, these observations are based on our in-house benchmarking of these GPUs, so we'd love to hear about your experiences too. Please post your comments below. Which cards do you use, if any? What are your workflows and how have they performed? Now, we hope you find the murky waters of data center GPUs a little bit clearer after watching this video, but of course, please don't hesitate to get in touch with the SCAN IT team if you want more questions answered or to discuss any of your requirements. And as we said previously, we'll also be producing more videos looking at various areas of infrastructure technology and how best to use it. So keep your eyes peeled for those and subscribe so you don't miss out. Also, why not let us know any particular topics that you want further information on or demystifying and we'll do our best to help you out. Bye for now.